let us invite our final speaker for this first plenary uh, to the stage, uh, Dr. Sharon McGuinness. A very warm welcome to you. Uh, uh, Sharon, you are the Executive Director of the European Chemicals Agency, uh, and before that, uh, from 2018 to 2022, CEO of Health and Safety Ireland. You have a background in industry, in policy, in academia, so we're really looking forward to a broad uh, uh, presentation from you. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you again to the organizers for inviting me here. Um, I have to say I've already listened and learned an awful lot listening to the previous speakers. And as a, a, a person, it's very hard not to be moved and provoked by some of the images and, and uh, evidence presented. But obviously, I'm here as the representative of the European Chemicals Agency, um, which is an agency based here in Europe. And I want to talk about, I suppose, the work we're doing and we're trying to do to prevent the chemical pollution and indeed many of the, the challenges we talked about, both in climate and biodiversity loss. And I might just introduce uh, ECHA to you, because I'm not sure if you all know about us. Um, we're one of 35 uh, decentralized agencies in Europe, um, and we are a regulatory agency mandated by the decision makers in the European Parliament and member states, and we get funding from the European budget and from industry fees. Uh, we've been in existence since 2007, and in, in like maybe some other agencies out there, we tend to have a double legal basis. So our basis is not just very much the, the promotion and protection of, of health and the environment, but also concerns the internal market here in Europe, as well as ensuring the competitiveness and, and supporting the competitiveness of chemicals industry. And as part of that work and, and that aims, we're here through the implementing of 10 different European regulations and directives and several different specific agreements with Commission, other agencies and the scientific community. So we're part of a community of, of uh, stakeholders involved in trying to address all of these challenges that we heard about around health and the environment. And we implement and work through our mandates by both carrying out technical, scientific and administrative tasks, but also by providing consistent, independent and high quality opinions and decision make, uh, decisions, which hopefully go on then to inform the policy makers and the political uh, system to adopt and draft uh, union measures. And obviously in all of this work, collaboration both with uh, member states, with commission, with agencies, industry and indeed civil societies and academics is all part of our role too. And in that regard, I suppose uh, perhaps two of the more common and maybe well-known pieces of legislation that we have as, as an agency to, to implement are two pieces called, one is called REACH, the Registration, Evaluation, Authorization of Chemicals, and the other is called Classification, Packaging and Labeling, uh, or CLP regulation. And I might just talk a little bit about both of them because in some ways they're perhaps the, the start of the system here in Europe for how we regulate and take care of many of the chemicals chemicals uh, that cause some of these, uh, many of these problems. Um, REACH as a regulation as a number of aims. Again, it's a high level of protection of health and the environment. It's to provide for the free circulation of substances on the market and enhancing uh, competitiveness in innovation. It's also there to promote the alternative methods to the assessment, for the assessment of chemicals. And the regulation covers the manufacture, import and use of chemicals and has a number of different elements. So I might just run through those briefly. So registration of substances over one tonne per annum. And this requires industry, who we are deem here as the duty holders and the ones that should know the most about their own chemicals if they're putting them on the market, they have to provide an increasing level of information to the agency as they're on their substance as the tonnage level increases. And registration will give them market access uh, to, to, to the companies for those particular substances. And as a general rule, testing on animals, it, is to 
to provide information on substances cannot be done without prior, um, without providing a testing proposal to the agency to assess. And as of the end of September, we have over 104,000 registrations covering over 127,000 chemicals and over 18, almost 18,000 companies. So it's a very large database of information. We then have evaluation, that's where the registration dossier is checked for compliance or where a testing proposal submitted by the registrant is assessed. And that's called either, you know, this is called dossier evaluation. And member states may also take substances and decide to evaluate it um, when they have grounds for considering that there may be a given substitute constitutes a particular risk to health or the environment. And we obviously support member states in that work. Now these are two, perhaps as I call them, very much initial steps in the process for assessing chemicals here in Europe. And then out of those we should be able to determine what, if anything, is needed further to take account of the chemicals, particularly of the particular hazards, and how we might risk manage those. And the two main pathways for risk management in REACH are called authorization and restriction. And authorization is where substances are very high concern, and this is where we have the carcinogens, the endocrine disruptors, the persistent chemicals, um, and those with equivalent levels of concerns cannot be used unless they're authorized uh, for a particular use by a particular company for a particular amount of time with a view to their eventual substitution. So there are presently about 59 chemicals on the substances of very high list, and they will result in the chemical the companies under obligations in terms of reporting, but also if added for authorization down the line, they'll have to apply uh, for an application for a particular use if they want to continue it. Restriction is the process whereby a substance or a group of substances, for example, where it's deemed there's an unacceptable risk across Europe, it, these are either banned or restricted for manufacture use or placing on the market. Um, and I was interested that a lot of the chemicals mentioned in some of the slides earlier, many of them are already restricted here in Europe or have been or will be shortly fully restricted and I might come back to that in a moment. There is another piece of risk uh, management legislation called the Classification, Labelling and Packaging Regulation, which identifies the hazard of a substance. Um, and obviously, depending on the nature of the hazard identified here, then that chemical could be banned for particular use. For example, right now, if a chemical is classified as a carcinogen, a CMR, it is automatically banned in terms of consumer use as a substance or mixture. Um, it can, if it's particularly uh, classified as well in some of these uh, hazards, be, be managed in a particular way under occupational health and safety uh, legislation, or indeed may not be allowed to be used in downstream products such as toys, cosmetics, etc. Now, many of you probably are aware that in December 2019, the European Commission published its EU Green Deal, and that was, of course, a very ambitious plan for Europe to tackle many different challenges. And a key pillar of that particular deal was the zero pollution, um, and under this umbrella, the Commission published a chemical strategy for sustainability, uh, which sets out a number of actions under different areas. These include around innovating for safe and sustainable chemicals, strengthening legislation, simplification and coherence, knowledge and science, and global. And some of these key actions uh, within the strategy include the introducing a ban on the most harmful chemicals in consumer products by allowing those chemicals only be used where their use is essential paying attention to the cocktail effects of chemicals when ass assessing chemical risks, phasing out PFAS in the EU, on, again, unless use is essential, boosting investment and innovation capacity for the production and use of chemicals that are safe and design uh, sustainable right from, by design right through the life cycle. Uh, establishing a simpler, what we call one substance, one assessment process for assessing the risks and hazards of chemicals and playing a leading role globally by championing and promoting high chemical safety standards, uh, not just in, in here in Europe, but also uh, worldwide by not exporting uh, chemicals banned in the EU. Now, 
that's a very big brush and obviously the Commission are the policy and uh, drivers and makers in this case and obviously as an agency we are working with them and supporting them in the, the role of that in terms of either implementing any change to legislation but also supporting any policy developments with information and knowledge as well. And I might just talk a little bit about some of the, the areas of focus coming both from the CSS but also from the agency's own perspective, um, which might inform you uh, about the, your discussions today and maybe show uh, some of the areas that are of relevance for how we might tackle chemical pollution and, and health in the future. So in relation to existing legislation, the Commission has already uh, prepared a number of proposals, including the revision of the classification uh, regulation, which is currently making its way through the EU decision-making process. Now that proposal to amend the CLP regulation to take account of new hazards such as endocrine disruption, persistence and mobility will ensure these uh, hazards are clear, centrally and clearly uh, identified. And then that would allow further action to be taken under specific, more specific or uh, relevant legislation downstream. Um, bringing all that hazard identification into one place will also bring greater clarity to the hazard identification across all legislation and allows regulators and stakeholders uh, to take more appropriate action. And it's some way going forward with the, the chemical strategy drive for a one substance, one assessment. In other words, that's the aim to address inconsistencies in hazard identification between uh, different types of chemicals because of their particular use. So whether you're an industrial chemical, a biocide or pesticide. And right now, ED's endocrine disrupting chemicals, for example, are regulated in REACH, regulated in biocides, regulated in plant protection products. So you have three different pieces of legislation which can identify an ED, as opposed to being in where it should be, which is around the CLP for proper hazard classification, therefore being used elsewhere, then we can take account of how to use it. The Commission, again with our support from the agency, is working to bring these new hazards uh, into the globally harmonized system, which as you know drives uh, the CLP and vice versa. And it, that's with the aim that all EDs, PBTs, persistent mobile toxic chemicals and all those hazards should be identified in the same way uh, globally. Now, my own view is chemicals don't do borders. I've never seen a chemical stop at the border and, and what changes at borders is regulation and identification. And so, if we want to address some of these far-reaching problems, um, it is really important that we just not look th at this in our own particular regulatory area, but also look at it at the broader global level as well, because an ED is an ED, uh, a carcinogen is a carcinogen, and it just doesn't matter where that is if we have uh, and start with uh, a single piece of identification for those hazards under the GHS. Now, with respect to the REACH regulation, I'm sure you're all very well aware there's, there's been a lot of discussion on that, and we are currently working closely with Commission colleagues, uh, providing input and advice on how we can perhaps uh, change the legislation and revi revise it in the future based on experience, but also a need to drive and, and increase the, maybe the speed and the efficiency at which we take decisions on particular chemicals. And that work is still going on. But I might just say that we still have a lot of legislation right now and I think we always need, and I suppose being a regulator and somebody who's been in that role for a long time, it's very important we don't lose sight of what we have now with the view to keep looking ahead because there's a lot right now we have that needs to be fully and properly implemented and that's what we as an agency are aiming to do. It's the, it's the full implementation. And that implementation of current legislation requires not just the agency, it requires member states, it requires industry and all the different stakeholders uh, to play their part. So in, re in relation to the, the current legislation, the Commission has already developed a number of, uh, uh, rather taken some specific action, and that includes, for example, a restrictions roadmap, um, which is to show the progress and to, to outline the progress they want on restricting the most harmful chemicals, groups of substances. Um, and that restriction 
roadmap is there to provide a balance between the need for flexibility on when and how to act, but also while securing progress on restricting these uh, most harmful groups of substances. Um, and the aim of the, the roadmap is also to increase transparency. And one of the challenges I think we often see is, you know, companies will say we need predictability or certainty. And you can see, okay, that's fine. Uh, however, it's also important to people realize we are going to target things, in, not just today, but in the future. And can they start to consider how, uh, as you say, to design out and to stop using these in advance of any regulatory action? And, and again, this roadmap is there to um, help stakeholders anticipate and consider future action uh, that might be taken on the particular substance. Um, we are doing a number of assessments here in ECHA under what we call Article 69.2 of REACH, uh, and those are subs those are assessments are for substances currently listed for authorisation um, in Annex 14 of REACH to see if these if the risks from those substances are when they are contained in articles are controlled because at the moment authorisation really follows to the use it doesn't uh, address the actual substance of very high concern in in a finished article, for example. And we'll be constantly working and publishing these as, as we go on into the future. Um, you might be aware that this year one of the more significant restrictions uh, agreed is the one on microplastics, and that came in uh, just there last week on the 17th of October. Um, the aim of the restriction was to prevent the pollution from intentionally added microplastics, and it concerns synthetic uh, polymer microplastic below five millimeters that are organic, insoluble, and resist to degradation. Uh, within that restriction, and this is probably what Europe does, we do a lot of time-limited derogations, but certain things are already uh, addressed as no longer possible, um, such as, for example, glitter, um, that's already prevented because why? There are safer alternatives. It doesn't prevent you using glitter, but there are, there are more safer alternatives out there. And it's hoped that this will prevent the release of half a million tons of, of microplastics over the next 20 years. Uh, and we in ECA, together with, we produced the dossier and together with our committees, uh, provided the opinion that, that formed the basis of that particular decision. Um, Maybe in, in the last few seconds here, talk a little bit about some of the elements in the chemical strategy, which might be useful for the conversations here today, but also are useful for those that are in the business of, of producing chemicals or thinking about chemicals in the future might want to consider. Um, Again, the idea of grouping, that's, that's really talked a lot about in, in the chemical strategy. And I suppose the first thing is, um, it's interesting and, and one of the challenges I think worldwide and, and even probably amongst this room is we tend to use a lot of terminology. But my version of what a group is and your version of a group is probably is very different. Uh, so we see the benefit and we recognize that the, 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 one of the steps that can increase efficiency in opinion making and decision making is to address groups of chemicals rather than each individual chemical because that probably has been the way we've done it for, for some time. Uh, as an agency, we're already using a grouping to help us map what we call the chemical universe, but also to identify and screen for all the chemicals on that database, over 100,000, as I mentioned, for possible regulatory actions in relation to those groups of chemicals. Um, and we're now working with member states to uh, determine how, how we can group chemicals together for risk management purposes. So that could be for uh, identifying a, a chemical, a particular hazardous property, or for taking a restriction if necessary. And certainly on restrictions, you will all no doubt have, have been well aware of the current uh, universal PFAS dossier, which has been submitted by colleagues from Denmark, the Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, and Norway. That universal PFAS proposal is, is a good example of grouping of substances uh, together for regulatory action. It's also a good example of collaboration with member states and ECHA uh, to, to bring that forward, but also is addressing very much the CSS target to look at PFAS uh, substances in general. Um, and, and that work is, is ongoing at, at present. And as you know, if we have all, if we have to deal with all the challenges and all the, ch uh, and all the problems we just saw there, taking individual substances 
one by one is perhaps is not really going to get us there perhaps fast enough. So grouping has to be part of the conversation. Um, and as I said, in order to group, obviously we need to then make sure that the legal and the legislative basis that we have allows us to take that fully through uh, the process. Um, another reason for good for grouping and looking at things is is to prevent regrettable substitution. And we know when, for example, when bisphenol A was identified in an SVHC, unfortunately, instead of people, uh, you know, they moved to the next bisphenol in the group, so bisphenol S. Um, and therefore, we want to prevent this type of action. So by taking the whole group of substances in a single regulatory uh, action, that's, that's important. Um, I also think industry also needs to be uh, to realize that even if you have one substance in a family that is regulated, simply substituting with perhaps another substance in that group may be meeting the letter of the law, but perhaps not the spirit of the law. And it's again that idea of your choices as, 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 as industry, what do you want to do in order to address it? And do you as well look at it much more broadly in the concept of what are you doing to contribute to the overall goals of health and, and the environment? Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to be in the workshop on testing and perhaps one of the, the aims of REACH is, as I mentioned, to promote the alternatives for the assessment of hazards to chemical substances. And we've obviously done a lot of work in that regard here in ECHA and, and we'll continue to do it into the future as well. But under the CSS, reducing the need for animal testing is highlighted and it's, it's there to both improve the quality and efficiency and perhaps the speed of chemical hazard and risk assessments, as well as protecting and, and preventing uh, animal testing. But we all know that testing on animals has been our cornerstone for, for legislation for hazard and risk for many years. Um, and therefore, at the present, this goal of reducing animal testing for, certainly for industrial chemicals, might be a difficult one to seem to achieve. Um, particularly as we need to speed up on uh, hazard assessment and, and maybe risk assessment of chemicals. However, with the increasing calls from citizens, from NGOs and industry and others, there's an onus on us all to start looking into that space and to see how we can work together to determine how we can use those particular new methods, no novel alternative methods, um, both to deliver the goal of reducing animal testing, but also to um, speed up the process and still have the same high level of protection of health and the environment that we all strive for. Another aspect is data, and we talked, you know, we talk, we talk a lot about data in today's world, and it is a really important uh, part for us as, as an organization. But we have to have access as a regulator to data that is relevant and usable in a regulatory context. And I know that can be frustrating for people because they go, but we have all this information. But as a regulator, we are bound by the regulation, and therefore some of the information or data that we have while it's great to capture, we obviously need to make sure that uh, we also have the data captured. We're getting the knowledge out of that to take real uh, tangible action uh, that can last the process of opinion making, but equally get into decision making at the end of the day as well. Um, and we also need to have the most up-to-date uh, information available, and that's where obviously industry are always being reminded that, you know, when you you're, you know your chemicals best, and we you need to keep that information certainly in registration dossiers and elsewhere up to date and up to speed, so that we can do the best job we can in terms of analysing and using that information. And. There's a huge amount of data out there and it comes from lots of different perspectives. So you have regulatory, environmental monitoring, you have occupational hygiene, academic, etc. But turning it into knowledge in a consistent and as I said, faster way is a challenge for us all. And mentioning earlier, you know, an academic study can be really valuable to advance the science and the knowledge, but using it in regulation may, may be a challenge. Um, 
Um, we've seen that this difference between academic studies and regulatory needs is a challenge. Um, part of ECHA is part of the, the work with PARC, which is a partnership for the risk assessment of chemicals. We're looking to address, and we recently published a report on key areas of regulatory challenge, which highlights the regulatory areas where it is still difficult to assess using current tests or understanding. And we would hope to and aim to report these on a, on a regular basis so that academics and other researchers can see where the, where the issues are and perhaps help us resolve them and provide uh, the research or study needed to address. In terms of, um, as I said, the, the one substance, one assessment, you know, again, the idea behind that is a single place for assessment, but equally a place where regulators as, as a whole can work to, together. Um, and that is why, you know, that, that concept of, of one substance, one assessment is very important. Uh, and with the change in CLP regulation, we hope to uh, be able to achieve that. And as I said earlier, the hazard of a chemical doesn't change just because it's used in a different way. It is there as an intrinsic property. And from my own experience over the years, each piece of legislation or regulation is important, but each needs to be seen in the context of how they are implemented, not only by the regulators, but the industry and others too. And a challenge perhaps for addressing chemical pollution and one health is how to ensure that all regulations that deal with chemicals work in tandem to achieve the ultimate aim of protecting health and the environment. So, you know, we all have our different pieces, but somewhere we have to bring them uh, together as well. Um, we have a very strong drive for governance and transparency, but we understand, and, and this is important because the chemical, uh, the public need to trust the work that we deliver on. Uh, but we do recognise that collaboration with all the relevant stakeholders is is important, and that includes industry, civil society, academia. But collaboration, in our view, should never and does never stop us making and taking the right regulatory action when we need to. So I think that's a really important thing. It also needs, we need to look at the competence. Those challenges are big, and as I said, the days of us all being trained as a toxicologist, as a chemist, as a what, we are now going to need a, a much more fluid type of competence and experience, and you know, putting the, the call out there to academics to think broadly, how does the world work and how do chemicals get used, so that we can use all of the different disciplines in a, in a coherent and consistent fashion. And I, I might just close a little bit on the global perspective, because there was a mention there of it. We're not directly involved. That's obviously the global um, area for, for Europe is done by the Commission, but obviously we're there to support it. And we just recently had uh, the ICCM5 meet in Bonn, and, and I think just on Friday, uh, they, they published their advanced material. And again, it's that recognition to try and bring this at a broader level, because we can regulate chemicals here in Europe, in the US, in Australia, Canada, wherever, but chemicals travel. Unfortunately, sometimes in the wrong way, but they travel and we need to recognize that to address all of these challenges, it, it needs a global driver. And again, I mentioned the work that's been done under the globally harmonized system, for example. So while it might seem as if tackling all of this is, is quite uh, challenging, um, I think, you know, if we do work together, uh, we can develop the science and, and generate the, the, the knowledge to address the, the challenge of chemical pollution and one health. It, it won't take one person, it won't take one organization, uh, but I think collectively, and looking here in the room, I see a huge interest in the topic and I know Ineca and myself, we very much want to be part of that. And as I said, we will play our role as a regulator, but we will also try and support the work of the research and the other um, disciplines and thinking around how do we address chemical pollution and the wider issue of health, not just for us as individuals, but for our planet too. Thank you. <laughs>